Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. Uh, you can see we're looking at something uh, very different this time. This is an Atari Vox Plus um, from Atari Age. Here, if you go to the Atari Age website, you can uh, order these from there. Now, this primarily works with the uh, Atari 2600. It also supports the 7800, I think. Uh, perhaps in the 2600 mode, I'm not sure. And uh, Vectrex as well. You need a cable, I think, to adapt uh, with the uh, Vectrex, uh, Vectrex there. But as soon as I heard about these, I went and did a bit of research because I was really curious as to uh, how these worked. It uses a speech jet chip. Uh, I might take the lid off after just have a look inside. I'm not sure whether it's glued or not. The case has got that kind of, well, it looks like it's molded. I don't know, I was going to say 3D printed, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's just a cheap molded case. But it's good quality. It looks great and stuff. It fits really well. So you can see you've got a, 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 a 9-pin uh, D-type connector there, joystick port type connector. So that's how it connects to the 2600. <clears throat> you plug it into, I think, the second joystick port. It might vary actually from game to game, depending on which port the main joystick goes in. You know, you plug this into the other one. But for the most part, I think it goes into the left-hand uh, port there, and the joystick goes into the right-hand port. And you can see it's got a 3.5mm socket on the back there. It's going to be mono, I think. Uh, it might be stereo. I'm not sure. Um, and the speech jet chip inside, uh, you know, provides uh, not really text to speech, but you can get text to speech out of it by using the allophones. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Show you the uh, a bit of the page of the data sheet there that you know how the allophones actually work. Um, so it's powered. It's powered by the uh, 2600 joystick port there, and you've got four pins that are connected to. Um, you know that joystick port. Two of them are used for the serial interface to this um, and the way it works you communicate with it at 19 200 board rate. Uh, I think it's eight uh, data bits, one stop bit and no parity. Um, and then you can just send commands, you know, write single bytes to it to get specific allophones and there are some built-in sound effects and things as well. But this has also got like a five channel synthesizer built in that you know that, that you know forms the uh, allophones and things as well so you could play music on this actually if you wrote some clever code sorry the cat's coming into shot again it's trying to try and knock the camera off i think um so following me working out these a serial uh, a serial device i use a serial there and that's all the 2600 is doing it's communicating by two two pins there um you know a serial connection to the device to output allophones, you know, a, byte, a single byte representing a particular allophone. Um, and I think you've just got to end, you know, you terminate um, a communication there with like, I think, FF. Um, you've also got to wait for a particular signal. I'll cover that in a minute when I get onto the code. I'll show you some code in a minute that I've written. Um, but I thought at that point, let's go away and buy one of these, uh, something like a Max 232. This isn't a 232, it's just an equivalent. So you can buy these for a couple of pounds off eBay. I think this one cost me three pounds actually. Uh, you can see I added a cap underneath there because there wasn't very much on the way of bypass stuff going on. And there's a bit of noise coming through this device. Uh, so that might be a mod that someone might want to do to one of these if you get one. Consider doing um, some sort of mod to tidy up the audio bit. It may be because I'm running it on the PC uh, via the serial here. I guess on the 2600 it might be silent. And actually I've just tested on the speaker and I don't hear the noise so much, so it's just some high frequency noise that maybe is coming from the PC being nearby. It could be because of this device here and the crystal and everything, the very short unshielded wires, you know, between the two. Um, but anyway, sort of sidetracking aside, uh, the idea was to connect this to the PC um, and then just write uh, some basic code there to send some bytes via the serial port uh, to this device. And I've got that working, I'll show you that in a sec. It's uh, it was surprisingly easy actually. Um, but beyond that, the other thing I thought about, and what I wanted to do is test on the PC first, but then you could in theory connect one of these to any home computer or system that's got serial port capability. Um, so I'm thinking along the lines of things like the Atari ST, the Amiga, uh, those, neither of those systems will have a problem with 19.2 uh, board rate there, 19,200. Uh, um, Maybe even the Commodore 64. Again, I don't know whether the serial port's up to the job on the 64 because I don't know much about the specs there. So just looking at the leaflet that came with this, it's uh, it's quite nice. Uh, speech slash music synthesizer and a memory card. That's the thing I forgot to mention. I think this has got save RAM 
built in as well you know non volatile I don't know whether it's uh, what size it is it might tell us inside but uh, yeah you can see there you know 2600 700 and Vectrex designed by Richard Hutchinson it's uh, a lovely piece of hardware really it's really simple uh, and I don't need to take the lid off you can see uh, here if I just zoom in a bit um, so we've got the speech jet uh, chip at the top there some dip switches uh, it shows you here what you can uh, just off camera you can, there what you can do with those uh, I think one of them is put it in Vectrex compatibility mode in fact it shows that up here Vectrex uh, you need that uh, the dip switch setting there default it's set to 2600 and 7800 yeah I think that's the pin there's a pin header there and I think those jumpers relate to that actually uh, maybe for programming it and stuff um, if you wanted to update it. Um, so there's some links on here for the drivers and various other things. Uh, so what else will be on here? Well an op amp probably for the audio output. You've got your 3.5mm uh, socket out there. It's quite a simple nice little tidy little board there. There might be a ROM or something or an MCU. I'm not sure what, why there's three little chips on there. No idea. Yes, yeah, so on the first page there it gives you a bit of an introduction and it does say 32k of non-volatile memory. Um, so you can use that as well. Um, you need to think about how you wire that into certain systems, because uh, obviously, you know, I'm just testing it with the serial port here. Um, I'm not sure whether we'd ha have the sufficient number of connections on the serial port to connect up that, you know, the um, non-volatile side as well. I'm not sure. I think on the Max 232 chip you can, um, but on a, you know, on a, like an ST serial port or an Amiga serial port, I'm not sure. Uh, it is a long time since I looked at serial stuff. The last time I did anything with serial really well, that's not true actually, about a year or two back I, I took one of those little UX Max 232 adapters and connected to a Comlinks cable and I've got a client that I wrote for that actually. Um, I've never released it in order to program uh, the Lynx flash cart there from Lynxman. Um, I don't think it's applicable to the, the current model because he updated the firmware and changed the command protocol there so it perhaps doesn't work anymore but it works with mine because I got a slightly different card from him but I also did that the whole comlinks to uh, Max232 thing so that I could connect my PC up to the links and uh, you know download software onto the links um, I'll perhaps show that in a later video um, yeah, I got that working as well, so that works. You can just you use a particular card to boot the links, and once that that once that client's running, um, you can just send things down the cable to the links. And as long as you've got a, a, a game image that's not larger than the RAM, it should fit nicely into the RAM there, and then it resets, you know, and starts the execution for wherever the, the start of the code is. Um, but that's a project, you know, something to show for another day, I think. And on the back page there, it just mentions some of the games. There are a few more than this actually. There's some homebrew stuff, and you know a lot of these are homebrew, but there are some additional homebrew tiles that don't appear on the list here. Like there's a hacked version of Berserk, for example, that will work with this. Um, Juno First is the most popular one, I think. Um, that was where I first saw this product actually on uh, Silver Fox's channel. I'll post a link down to his channel um, in the video. Um, yeah, and there's only a few games on the 7800 and uh, a bunch of games on the Vectrex there. But like I said, the idea behind the, this video really is just to get more exposure to this. Maybe we can, you know, people might start developing um, support for this on other platforms. Um, I was going to, at some point, what I'll perhaps do, there might be part two to this video. What I might do is get out of the Lattice C compiler, write a bit of code on the Amiga there, and see if I can get a similar client, um, the one I'm going to show you in a minute on the PC, on the Amiga. Um, just to test it on the Amiga, really. I can't imagine that would take too much effort. So just looking at the diagram here, this diagram came from Atari Age. I'll post a link to it in the description below. You can see the 9-pin uh, D-type connector here. So this would connect to, you know, go to the Atari 2600, or in my case, it's going to go to the USB adapter. Um, and if you look at pin 1, pin 1 goes all the way up here to the TXD pin. So that's transmit data. Uh, so data's going to come out of... Um, the PC in my case and into pin 1 so in the 2600 obviously the 2600 is going to be writing to that pin 1 uh, you know uh, to, in order to get the, 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 the bytes in there um, pin 2 if you look where that connects that comes all the way around here to CTS which is the clear to send pin so that pin I think goes high when this device is um, able to uh, receive data and then, of course, the final thing you need is ground and VCC to go to uh, the uh, speak jets. You know, it's obviously going to be powered, and it's powered by 5 volts. And on the little uh, USB board adapter I've got there, 
um, it, that will provide 5 volts or 3.3 so you've got a couple of jumpers on there I'll probably give you a close-up of those jumpers in a minute but they're configured at the moment to set to 5 volts and like I said I've just taken the ground and the 5 volts from a USB um, adapter uh, into the relevant pins there pin 7 is VCC, pin 8 is ground and on the back of the D-type connector usually on the moulding you'll see the numbers there so it's dead straightforward to do that you've got 4 wires so a macro view of the board there now, so you can see I did take off the 5 volts from the top pin there, that's going to um, you know the, the pin on there, was it pin 7, pin 8 I think it was, or pin 7, I can't remember, on that previous diagram to supply the 5 volts. Um, the next pin down is 3.3, .3, so if you're using certain serial devices that are, you know you, that make use of the lower voltage there, you can use the 3.3 .3 as your supply. Uh, but then you've got, as you can see, TXD, which is going to the TXD pin, um, RXD and ground. So RXD is not used, obviously ground is. Uh, and then the final one I've had to add a single pin for. You can see there is the CTS clear to send. Um, and what I've done is got one of these um, panel mount um, ones that where they're, they're straight in line, you know. Um, so you could just, I've just been able to plug on there, haven't to solder anything really, just to solder the single, single um, pin header there because as you can see there's one missing from over there as well it would have been nice if they'd uh, maybe put those next to each other and just stuck a two pin header because then you know it would have made it a bit more modular um, but this board like I say supports so it that's good there's an extra jumper there I'll just pull that off when it shipped to me the RX um, D and CXD uh, have I got those around the wrong way yeah, RXD and TXD, the receive and transmit, were joined up with a jumper. And that's a common technique people use to test serial devices. So, you know, you plug it into the USB port, write some data out, and at the same time, it should be echoing back. You know, if you set your comm software up to read um, at the same time as write, you should see the same thing. You know, if you output hello world, you'll see hello world received back and that's that's why that jumper was on there uh, so just for now I stuck it on there overhanging but you can see that's the jumper position there for uh, 5 volts or 3.3 um, it's strange because oh yeah yeah that will relate to the logic levels yeah I was going to say because you've got 3.3 and 5 volt things there for the those are the supply rails but this will dictate the logic levels of these signals. So if you get that set wrong, if you set that to 3.3 .3 and you connect this up to an Amiga or an ST or a 2600 or Vectrex or whatever, it's, you know, working with uh, probably TTL or CMOS levels, 5 volts roughly, uh, you could destroy uh, the chip. It might not last very long. So it is important to make sure you've got the, uh, that, that switch there to, to 5 volts. Uh, and do make sure you're using the 5 volt supply there for, you know, uh, devices you're powering um, like this. That need five volts. So we'll just plug this into my PC now. Um, so I've got USB ports on the front here. Plug it in. The LEDs on. Um, I didn't want this thing flapping around. That unfortunately on this I've got one of these little drawers here for the SD readers and compact flash and all that. So it'll sit quite nicely there. So all I need to do now is just plug a 3.5 mil audio cable in, route it to some device to test it. Maybe some headphones or something. So I've just tested on the headphones here and that works fine but what I want to do is uh, just plug in uh, a 3.5mm audio lead here and I'll show you, I've connected it up to this uh, box that uh, Ali, um, it came from Ali actually this so we can now test it on the PC So I knocked up some code in C Sharp um, it is really basic this as you can see we've got a list of COM ports there at the moment I've only got the single device connected an interesting side note with that is when you connect one of these up to your PC if the COM port is greater than uh, say COM port 9 where you, you get onto double digits the uh, Stellar, the emulator, the Atari 2600 emulator which does support the Vectrex on one of these USB devices here it won't be able to see it, won't connect because you, you originally I think when I first connected this up it said COM 20 I had a load of Bluetooth uh, com ports like you know 19 of them or something in the list there which is strange because I don't even have a Bluetooth device plugged in there must be legacy drivers that were just left over from whenever I've plugged that device in um, and when when this device the Vectrex 2 was connected to com port 20 um, in the Stellar software despite it being set to com port 20 it just didn't work there was just nothing no errors nothing at all so at that point I thought I wonder if it's the double digit thing so I went away and removed all the Bluetooth 19 or 20 of them Bluetooth drivers which were not not you doing anything removed the um, the serial driver for this 
plugs back in the little that Max 232 device there, it then reinstalled it and it assigned COM3. I'm not sure where COM1 and COM2 are, maybe it's because those are standard system COM ports or something, I ain't got a clue. But it's uh, assigned COM3 and then it tested it again with the um, Stellar emulator there, changed it to COM3 and it works. So you can use this with a PC, with the cable I've shown there, um, to you know use the uh, Atari Vox in Stellar the Atari 2600 emulator there, so um, that's useful to know. So, let's well, say so I've got a refresh button here, just to refresh the list in case you've only just plugged the device in, and if we connect, you can hear it say hello there. Uh, I'll just disconnect it, I'll just show you, some, well, I'll show you something, you'll hear it. I'll power the device up again, I'll unplug it and plug it back into the serial port, just listen. Yeah, so that's the sort of welcome splash message thing you get. Welcome Atari Vox or whatever it says. Um, so I'll connect it again. Uh, and then I've just got a test button down here at the moment, which is, I've just been going through some of the allophones. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit of that in a sec. If I just press the test button, you can hear the sound effect. So if I stop that, uh, and I'll just show you the allophones here actually. Um, yeah, hopefully that's gonna focus. So there is uh, this is uh, pay, uh, table C I think from the data sheet. Again, I'll post a link down below to this. Um, so you can see the uh, decimal the decimal code there of the bytes you want to send. So 128, for example, will give you a phonon of uh, I Y. So and this is where it gets really confusing, and it's going to take me a while to get my head around this. So it's giving you example. Let's supposed to say sample. It says SAML words. I think it's. <laughs> S sample is supposed to say. Um, so I think that's a C even feed. So you've got to, when you look at these examples, you've got to try and take the commonalities between them to try and understand what it means by what that phone is going to be. Um, so the way that, you know this, this device works is all the common sounds that we make with our tongues um, and vocal cords you know, uh, have been broken down and split up in here. So the common patterns, you know, the, the way you would s start to say a particular word and the way that vowels affect some of those words and things, they're all captured in this table. So it's quite a long list there, as you can see, and there's a lot of examples. So it's uh, it's incredible how difficult this is actually to get your head around. It's not as easy as just typing in, uh, you know, hello, and uh, it's saying hello. Um, in fact, I'll show you that in a sec. I'll show you how it's managed to s say hello. Uh, what uh, phonemes you need. And then on the right hand side here we've got some more of these phonemes that relate to, uh, you can see there it says phoneme type robot, so there's some sort of robot sounds and things there, there's some alarms, you can have a listen to those in a sec, some beeps, uh, some biological noises, I think one or two of those sound quite good actually, there's like a, a croaking frog, that sounds pretty good. DTMF tones, you know, for the old phone system there, so those could be quite useful. Um, and there's a few other effects, a sonar, a ping, and then obviously you've got numbers. Uh, in fact, let's just try one of these. Let's try uh, 7, because I like the number 7. Uh, that's, so the, the decimal for that is 247. Yeah, so the number 7 was 247, actually. Uh, so if we change that to 247, all this is doing is writing that single byte. Um, but it's also, if we just zoom in a little bit, so you can see the code a little bit clearer there. The way you work with this is the clear to send you've got to make sure that you know it's ready it's ready for data so you need to check that, that clear to send is uh, is not active so i think that's uh, looking for a low there uh, it could be the inverse actually cts holding i'm not sure whether that's going to be high or low uh, it says there gets the state of the clear line clear, clear to send line um, but yeah i've inverted the logic there so i'm saying if not uh, cts holding then start to write a byte. And I did a similar thing actually when it's reading out the hello bit, if you ignore, skip past that bit. Uh, you can see, uh, hopefully, if I just highlight the bytes, I'm not sure if this is fitting on the screen, let's move the camera across a little bit. You can see the string of uh, bytes there, or an array of bytes, that uh, says hello. So like that first one does correspond, if I look at the phonemes, 183, uh, and I'll see if I can get this on camera as well at the same time. It's, probably going to be quite hard to show you. If you look at uh, 183 here, it says HE, and in the examples it gives you is like help, help uh, I think. So yeah, it must be the ha, ha bit. So you've got the ha bit there, and then seven, yeah, seven's one of the uh, control commands I think you can use to change the tone or the frequency or extend a particular sound. I think that's what that one is. Uh, and then I think 159 is another phoneme, just looking at the list of phonemes here, 
that's its phoneme is E H L L, and the example it gives is saddle angle spell. So that must be the uh, part of the L bit. I'm not sure. Um, it's yeah. It's like I say. It is really really complicated to understand how these are actually working. One four six is L O. So the example it gives is clock plus hello. So yeah, you've, you've probably got the L O bit there. Um, that's probably extending the H bit there, I think. And then 164 is uh, OWW, -W. and the example is it says go, hello, snow. So that must be the W, -W bit. And then 255 is the terminator at the end there. So, you know, you can see how, just, how hard it is just to get it to say hello there. Um, there'll be a bit of trial and error, I would expect. So, what I need to do is change this app in a minute to. I have all the list of phonemes there with the codes as well and have them in a little list or something so I can add them in add in a little sequence there and test it at each stage and chop and change them in order to play around to, to, to get something that's usable but I figured that'd be useful anyway because then you could at least develop these strings of allophones on the PC here and maybe then you know use them in your apps maybe you use them on 2600 games or you know wherever else you use this device so just coming back to testing that, so just testing with the 7 there, this is my test routine, all I'm doing is writing a single byte out there, and I've changed the allophone there to the decimal 247, which should give us the digit 7. So if I now run that, connect, we should get hello, and I'll press the test button. Yeah, that's 7, it's DTMF. Yeah, that was my mistake there, I was expecting, when I saw the 7 here, I was expecting it to read out the number 7, because that's the decimal code which is 247 there to give us a 7. But actually, if you scroll across, it's a DTMF uh, tone. So, yeah, that's like a phone tone. You know, you could dial a number up using those on the old um, tone-based system. I forget what the hell it's called now. So I spent about an hour on this, actually, just throwing this together. Uh, I'll zoom you in a little bit, just so you can see a bit clearer. And again, sorry for the refresh around my screen there, the lines. Uh, so I will connect... Yeah, you can hear it's going really slow. I found a bug that if you adjust the speed, it doesn't reset itself. Uh, I think you can do a reset. Now, you can see here I've got two different combo boxes here. I've got one for control um, controls, and there's some gaps in here because there are some numbers not used. So I can tidy this up. The way it's working at the moment is a bit flaky, really. It's pretty fudge, fudgery, a bit of fudgery going on there just to get it working. So you can see you can select a control, and you just click Add and it adds it to the list here, and we've got the Terminator automatically. So if I send that now, that should reset it back to its default settings. And if I disconnect and reconnect, there you go, you can hear it's speaking at the correct speed now. Uh, now I've got a, a test here, I just played around with some allophones myself. If I just paste this in, this should say Atari in a sort of vague sort of way. So you can see, you know, with a bit of trial and error there, you, you, you can get it to say things. I'd need to experiment um, putting some of the control codes in here. You can see you've got ones to pause for amount of time. You can say the next uh, phone in uh, pretty fast there, um, or allophone, I should say, fast or slow. Uh, and there are some, you can change the tone, you can add a weight, uh, you can change the volume, the pitch, the speed, the bend. Not sure what that one is. Port, counter, port, CTR, no idea. Uh, and same with port, not sure. I need to look at the data sheet again for that. Um, and some of these others I'm not sure about. But let's say I've noticed some strange things. Like if you change the volume, um, it just goes silent. Doesn't matter what you set the value there to. Um, and the way I've done this is any of these have got a parameter. You can see you've got an X on that. So if I, if I want to change the pitch now, I choose pitch, click add, it adds it in, and you've got a P there. You need to manually type. I've got no validation. If you try to send that now, it would probably crash. Um, so I, I can optimize this later. Um, let's just try changing the pitch. Let's put 64 in there. I'm just going to chop that bit because those three were from the pitch command there. It's got the terminator at the end of 255. 22 was the command for the pitch, 64 was the parameter, so let's just, and a lot of those parameters are 0 to 127, so if I just cut that, stick that at the start, that should change the pitch of the whole thing, make sure there's no spaces, because again, I've not got any validation on there for additional spaces, and if we hit send, yeah, you can hear that's ridiculously fast. Now if I try changing the pitch, let's try changing it to 127, I bet that doesn't make any difference. Yeah, what seems to be happening is not resetting, it, it sticks with the value you've put in there, so the only way to get around that, if I just cut that out, 
we'll put a 31 in there to reset it, send that, disconnect it, reconnect it, paste that back in. Yeah, so I'm not sure what's going on there, you can hear it's like the pitch is just crazy. Uh, let's try changing the pitch to 1. See, it, it doesn't change. It's absolutely bizarre. I don't know whether this, this, um, this speak jet is limited, it's not got all the same functionality um, as the full you know, native chip that you can buy or whatever. I'm not sure. It's a bit strange. Uh, let's just try it again. 31255, send that. Disconnect it. Reconnect it. So you've got to disconnect and reconnect. That's bizarre. I'm not quite sure why. What, what's going on there, but um, so you know, from my experience, I found that these control commands here don't seem to work very well. I mean, the delays do, but if you change the pitch, the volume, the tone, any of those things, it stays stuck at that. Uh, now, it could be I've just missed something in the data sheet there. Um, so the allophones, uh, I've got the whole list of allophones in. You can click on one of those and it says it. And if I just go up and down the list with the keys, So the nice thing is, you can find what you listen. You know, you can listen to what you what you want here, and try and get them that way. And that was how I got it to say Atari pretty easily. Uh, and again, you know, you can just use the drop down list there to shoot down to what you want. So if we have a look at some of the end ones, wow. So that's the default uh, one that's built in. Pistol. Sonar. You can bring someone up with that. Those are the biological sounds. Sounds like R2 D2, that. Those do as well. And that. Very cool. Alarms. And some robotic sort of noises. And then you're back onto the allophones again. So yeah, with a bit of messing, you could probably use that to form a, you know, a simple sentence there, you know, a few words, etc. Um, I'll upload the source for that. You can have a tinker. It really is very pragmatic. I've just thrown this together in uh, approximately two hours today. Um, but it was just something just to get you know, like get a little utility together like this so I could fairly easily experiment with this because, you know, the way things stood, it was pretty hard trying to just work out which of these allophones to use. At least, you know, that might be useful to somebody, I guess. Uh, and there might be a follow on video. I will have a look at doing this last hour. I'll get the lattice compiler out and have a play around with um, both the ST and the Amiga just to see if I can link this up to those. And in theory, there's no reason why it shouldn't work. So the way you would use this is just go through and find the allophone you want. So if I find the, the start of the word Atari, if we go... Ah. Yeah, that one's not so bad. So let's stick with that. And you can just test that there by clicking that. Or you can add it. So we've got the A in there, and we can send the whole lot just to test what we've got. Uh, and then we need to find a T, I guess. T. T. It's going to be that, I think. That's going to be the nearest. It's very short, but again, you can play with the, uh, you know, play with these to speed them up, slow them down, etc. So we'll now find another A uh, to get the at Atari bit. You know. That might be the best one, actually. Atar, uh, yeah, let's add that one. And then we need to find an R. Uh, so let's just shoot down there. The, the list. I mean, I could sort them into alphabetical order, that might help. Yeah, so we've got an R there, so let's add that. Let's just test what we've got. See, so we just need an I. Uh, right, let's just go from the top. That's an I, actually. It's pretty short. Yeah, that first one's probably the best one to use, actually. So let's just add that, and we'll test it. So you can see there how I formed that. 
Uh, and obviously, like I say, you need to play with the pitch of individual sounds, the alphones there, and the speed of them. But, like I say, I'm also not clear as to why these seem to glitch out. Once you change any of these, it seems to stay stuck on whatever you've changed it to. You don't seem to be able to get back, but I'll have another read of the uh, developer, doc developer documentation there. So hopefully you found that uh, quick look there at the Atari uh, Vox here interesting uh, using the speech jet chip. Uh, now you know this has been done on other systems. You know, let's say it works on the Vectrex and stuff. But I did just find an article suggesting the speech jet chip has been used on the Spectrum before. So, but it's uh, it would be interesting to you know I will revisit this because like I say I think you, you can get this to work on an Amiga or an ST. Bear in mind those systems have got good sound capabilities anyway. But having uh, some more sound on there, why not? You know, if you can add it on there and add support into games and things you develop yourself, any homebrew and stuff, why not? So if you want one of these, you can order them from Atari Age. Uh, they're quite reasonably priced. I think it worked out about £40 roughly. Might have been a touch less than that actually. But, uh, you know, it can take a while for them to get built. You know, the build to order uh, and shipping, you know, is obviously from the States. So I think in my case, I was waiting about three or four weeks actually. I ordered this before Christmas and uh, very early December actually, it just arrived in the last few days. Anyway, hopefully you found it interesting, thanks for watching, I'll see you soon.